Would you turn back with me to Genesis chapter 20? I struggled with a title for this message. I've entitled this message, Abraham's Unbelief. That doesn't sound right, those two words together, Abraham and unbelief. But in this passage of scripture, we're given a story of Abraham's unbelief. And this is given to teach us the gospel. Now remember, everything in the New Testament is found by example in the book of Genesis. Somebody once said Genesis is the seed plot of all the Bible. And I do believe that. And remember, this is what God the Holy Spirit has recorded for our learning. Now I've said before that as far as men born of women Men born of Adam, there's nobody more significant than this man, Abraham. He's called the father of the faithful. He's called the friend of God. What a title. It was said of Abraham in Romans chapter 4, that he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform and the Spirit of God was pleased to inspire Moses when writing this book, Genesis, to give an event in Abraham's life where not only did his faith appear to be not strong, his faith appeared to be non-existent in this passage of Scripture. Now, you think of the setting, perhaps just a matter of weeks before He saw the destruction of Sodom. He had the Lord himself say to him, is anything too hard for the Lord? The Lord said that to him. He heard those words audibly in a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there anything he lacks the power to perform including taking care of and protecting you. He had just display, he had just witnessed this dis awesome display of the Lord's power. And when Abimelech confronted him about his unbelief, he said, I thought surely the fear of the Lord wasn't in this place. As if it could be there but not here. When he made that statement, he was denying the character of God Almighty, his omnipresence. The fear of the Lord isn't here. Now, the Lord had appeared to Abram some 30 years before, and some 25 years before this took place. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. There was a famine in the land, verse 10, Genesis 12, verse 10. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Now, I've heard many people say, well, he shouldn't have left. Well, if the famine was grievous in the land and you didn't have anything to eat, you'd probably do what he did. Verse 11, and it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarah, his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, This is his wife. 
and they'll kill me, but they'll save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister. Don't tell anybody you're my wife. Say, I'm his sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, and she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. He allowed her to be taken into Pharaoh's harem. Now, men, think about how your wives would respond to something like that. But he allowed that to take place. And he entreated Abram well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen. He gained most of his wealth through this. His asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou now tell me that she was thy wife? Why didst thou say she's my sister? Why'd you lie to me? So I might have taken her to me a wife. Now therefore behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Now Abraham came up with great wealth through this improper conduct, to say the least. Now in Genesis chapter 20, deja vu. Deja vu. He does the same thing. Sarah was still a beautiful woman, and she was 90 years old. And he was so afraid of him for himself because of her beauty that uh, he'd kill her or kill him and take her. Same thing that he thought years before. And one of the things I was thinking about, this is speculation, but maybe the Lord made uh, Sarah's aging to reverse to, in order to, in, to enable her to have the baby that she was going to have next year because she has Isaac in chapter 21 and maybe he did something that made her to where she didn't age or her aging reversed and she was able to bear a child even though she had been in um, uh, menopause. Now she is no longer that way and can bear a child. Perhaps that what is took place, but at any rate, he was very uh, scared because of her beauty, and he told her to lie. And off she's carried into Abimelech's harem, and evidently she was there for some time, because look in verse 17, so Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children, for the Lord had fast closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So evidently some months had passed, maybe a year, I don't know. And no one had any children in Abimelech's house, and it was because that the Lord had closed their wombs while Sarah was there. <clears throat> now, we don't read where Abraham did anything to try to get her back. Maybe he did, but we don't read of it. You remember when Lot was taken by the king of Sodom? And he and 318 trained servants came and delivered him, destroyed Sodom, and, and brought Lot back, and he delivered them. But we don't read of anything he did to get Sarah back. And here's one of the best words in Scripture, verse 3. But God. But God. Abraham failed on every account. But God. He's so glorious. But God. You can't help but think of that scripture in Ephesians 2, 4. And you hit the quick and who are dead in trespasses and sins. And he goes on to describe our deadness and so on. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins. But God. God intervened. And that's what salvation is. If there's not a but God with you and me, we'll go to hell. We won't have any faith. 
We won't be delivered, but God. Isn't that the gospel? But God. For Christ's sake, but God. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, verse 3, and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Now, this was before the giving of the Ten Commandments, and Abimelech knew adultery was wrong. Men are born knowing the difference between right and wrong. This heathen man knew adultery was wrong. He never had a copy of the law. But he knew it was wrong. Now the point is we're born into this world not uh, sinless, sinful, but we still know the difference between right and wrong. Everybody knows it's wrong to lie. Everybody knows it's wrong to steal. Everybody knows it's wrong to covet. Everybody knows it's wrong to kill. Everybody knows it's wrong to commit adultery. And it was wrong then. And the Lord comes to him at this time and confronts him about it. But Abimelech, verse 4, had not yet come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou also slay a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she's my sister? And she, even she herself said, he's my brother. They both lied. In the integrity of my heart. And the innocency of my hands have I done this. Now, he talks like any other heathen would. (laughs) I'm a good person. I just got tricked into this. I'm a man of integrity and innocency. And I think the Lord is uh, speaking somewhat ironically when he says, God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. That's why you didn't do it. Don't pat yourself on the back and say, I did this in the integrity of my heart. I withheld you from sinning against me. And let me say this, and I mean this from the depth of my heart. Any sin you do not physically commit, it's because he prevented it. You believe that? It's because he prevented it. Verse 7. Now therefore, restore the man his wife, for he's a prophet, and he shall pray for you, (laughs) and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die, and all that are in thine. Now I bet this was kind of hard for him to take. He lied to him. She lied to him. He played the part of a coward. He did wrong. He made no effort whatsoever that we read of to get his wife back. I don't know how long this lasted. And then God says to this man, he's a prophet. (laughs) He'll pray for you. (laughs) I bet that kind of got to him. I mean, really? The way he's, he's your prophet? He seems like a liar to me. He seems like a coward to me. He's your prophet. And I'm not going to be, I'm not the one in the wrong, and yet I'm going to have to have him praying for me before I'm not going to be killed. I'm sure that that was kind of a bitter pill for him to swallow as he considered that. But he knew What God said was so. He was going to die if he didn't do something about this. Verse 8. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all of his servants and told all these things in their ears. And the men were so afraid. We're getting ready to get put to death. Maybe they knew about Sodom. I bet they did. I mean that word travels. They thought the same thing is going to happen to us. And Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? You know, he was quote, righteously indignant at this time, wasn't he? What hast thou done unto us? 
What have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. Isn't that true? Now, he was wrong for taking Sarah in the first place, wasn't he? I don't care if he didn't know she was wife. He was wrong to do that. But he still says to Abraham, you've done to me deeds that ought not to be done. And Abimelech, verse 10, said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought. Now here's where we get in trouble. Because I thought. Same thing old Naaman said. I thought he'd come after me. And he'd strike his hand over the place and call upon the name of his God and recover the leper. He tells me to just dunk down in this filthy river Jordan. I'm not going to do that. He went away in a rage. He thought. Now, this is so important. If you, if, I hope you're hearing everything I say, but if you don't hear anything else, hear this. Turn to first, hold your finger there and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter four, verse six. And these things, brethren, have I in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think. Now, of men is in italics, isn't it? It's in italics. I'm sure that it's not wrong to put it there, but it wasn't there. Let's read this without the words that are in italics because they were not in the original. That you might learn in us not to think above that which is written. Now understand this. Somebody says, I just really can't see what you're saying. Is it written? That's the issue. Is it written? You see, the Bible is the absolute authority. Believe what God's Word says. If God says you're nothing but sin, believe it. It's what God says. If God says salvation is altogether by grace, believe it. It's what God says. Don't trust your thoughts. You think wrong. You can just write this down, whatever you think. Write it down. Whatever you naturally think, it's wrong. I thought. And what did he think? That was his problem. I thought. What did he think? Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Now, God had already made the promise, the Messiah is coming through you and your wife. I mean... There was no question about that. The Messiah, the promised seed, is coming through you and your wife. Well, I'm afraid to kill me and kill my wife. Too. Yeah, they, he didn't believe God at all at this time. I mean, this is very truly the unbelief of Abraham. He was not believing God's promise. You know, one of the things this reminds me of, is Abraham any different than you or I? He's really not. He's a sinner saved by grace. And at this time, he is exercising great Unbelief, great fear. And what he says is completely contrary to the attribute of God. When he says, I thought the fear of God is not in this place. Now, I know it was back in Sodom. I saw what happened. But here, what? That's a denial of his omniscience. That's a denial of his power. I mean, you can just go on and on. Abraham, at this time, through caving into fear, was making a statement that denied the very character of God. This is Abraham. You know, I, I feel almost funny entitling the message Abraham's unbelief, but what are you going to call it? <laughs> is there a better name to call this? Abraham's unbelief. What unbelief he demonstrated at this time. And then he vindicates himself. Verse 12, and yet indeed she is my sister. She's my half-sister. Uh, I gave you half the truth. 
Now remember, the half the truth is a whole lie. All the time. But he was trying to vindicate himself. I gave you half the truth. You know, she is my sister. She is my sister. I mean, she's my half sister. She's not my full blood sister, but I ended up marrying her. But I wasn't lying to you. When you're covering up the truth, you're lying. And that's exactly what he was doing. He was covering the truth. And he was lying. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She's the daughter of my father and not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. It came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house. This is so incongruent. God caused me to wander. Then I said, this is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me. At every place where we shall come, save me, he's my brother. <laughs> now God's causing you to wander. Isn't he going to take care of you? God destroyed Sodom. Isn't he going to take care of you? He's all powerful. But he made this deal with Sarah. This is what I want you to do. Wherever we go, you tell them you're my sister and that'll save my skin. If they don't see that, they'll kill me in order to get you. Verse 14. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham. Just like in Genesis chapter 12, he was enriched during that time. Same thing happened here. He comes out smelling like a rose. You say, that's not right. That's grace. That's grace. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother. I love the way he says it. He says, I've given your husband. He says, I've given your brother. He's saying that tongue in cheek. And you know he's doing that in order to correct her. That one you call your brother. I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all others. And thus she was reproved. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children, started going back to normal. For the Lord had fast closed up the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's Wife. Now, what do we learn from this? We learn a lot. First, we learn that Abraham, like every other believer, is still a sinner. That's plain, isn't it? You know, people talk about Abraham in such a way. Abraham's no different than me or you. He was still a sinner. Do you remember the man who cried out in Mark chapter 9, Lord, I believe... Help thou mine unbelief. These two things are always in operation at the same time. In every believer, there's an old nature that does not believe. And in every believer, there's a new nature that does believe. Abraham, like every other believer, had two natures, the old man and the new man. Now, this does not give any believer an excuse to ever sin in any form. Well, I got my old nature, you know, can't help it. It doesn't give a believer a justification or an excuse for sin in any form, but it certainly gives us an explanation for our sin, doesn't it? This old man, Abraham, had that every believer is a sinner saved by grace who's still a sinner in his experience, but he's also a saint, a sinner and a saint at the precise same time. And listen to this. That doesn't mean 50% sinner and 50% saint. That means 100% sinner and 100% saint. Such was Abraham. Grace is what God does. What did Abraham do in any of this that we see? Did he ask the Lord to get him at? He might have, I don't know, but the Holy Spirit's been pleased to make it to where we don't have a record of him doing anything. This is 100% what 
God did. But God, grace is what God does. Abraham didn't do anything to fix this. It was God who appeared to Abimelech. Grace is what God does. Grace is not God's response to be you asking for his help. That's not grace. Grace is not something God offers you if you'll just accept it. There's not a drop of grace in that kind of thinking. That's not saving grace. Grace is not what God offers. Grace is what God does. God acted here, didn't he? But God. Look back in verse 6 of our text. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. Here's why. I withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now, a couple of things I want to point out about that. First thing is this. Sin is against God. I kept you from sinning against me. Now, wait a minute. Wasn't he sinning against Abraham and Sarah? Well, I wouldn't say he wasn't, but here's the main problem. Sin is against God. I've withheld you from sinning against me. That's why David said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. That's why the prodigal said, I'll rise to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven. That's what he said first, didn't it? against heaven and in thy sight. You see, only when you see that your personal sin is against him will you come to him for mercy. You know, if I sin against Jonathan, I don't ask Rich to forgive me, I ask Jonathan to. It's only when I see my sin is against him that I'll truly ask him to have mercy on me and forgive me of my sin for Christ's sake. Only when you see it's against him do you ask him to do something for you? And you know it's got to be him doing something for you. And thank God for restraining grace. Abimelech speaks of his integrity and his innocency. This is just the language of a heathen, isn't it? <laughs> but thank God he was restrained. Now another thing that I see from this passage of Scripture is this teaches us something about the absolute sovereignty of God. King's heart, Abimelech, me, you, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. You see, Abimelech was in God's hand, so are me and you. Everybody, it doesn't matter who they are, they're in God's hand. Everybody that's troubling you, they're in God's hand, doing his will for his glory and your good. And that was true with regard to this man, Abimelech. And I like thinking about this too. You know, he said, I, I kept you from sinning against me. Could God have kept Adam from sinning? Of course he could. Why didn't he do it? Because it was all a part of his glorious purpose. Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And it was all according, according to God's purpose. Now, people, I, I, I think it's, I find it irritating now. I used to be intimidated by this. But I find it irritating now when people say, well, you're making God the author of sin. I'm not making God anything. God's who he is. And whatever he does is right. And I'm not going to apologize for it. Whatever he does is right. And he doesn't do it because it's right. He doesn't have some law over his head. It's right because he does it. And whatever he does is right, just, holy, good, and true. And it was best for Adam to fall. And look at all the good that's come out of it. The salvation of God's people, the glory of God. Verse 7. Now, restore the man his wife, for he's a prophet. And he'll pray for you. I, I love that. I mean, I'm sure Abimelech was thinking... Something's wrong with this. You tell me this man's a prophet? You tell me that if he prays for me, that's the only way I'm going to be healed? 
I'm, I don't know about this. I'm sure he was thinking things like that. That's because he's a heathen. That's because he didn't know the living God. But I'm sure it was difficult for him. But I want you to remember this. God views Abraham the way he views every other believer. Because of Christ, holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That's how God viewed Abraham at that time and right now and eternally. He's a prophet. He'll pray for you. And if you don't do what I say and restore her, you're a dead man and everybody in your house is. God brings good out of evil. Don't ever forget that. Only God can do that. Me and you can't. But the glorious God brings good out of evil. Now we learn from this story, this is what I learn. I'm bad. You learn that? Abraham did. It's not my faith that saves me. It's his faithfulness. You learn that? It's not my faith that saves me. It's his faithfulness. And I think it's so amazing that Abraham came out of all of this smelling like a rose. It's called justification. God justified. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Try it. Can be done. God justified them. And we have a beautiful, in closing, we have a beautiful type of Christ in verses 17 and 18. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children, for the Lord had fast closed up the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Abraham prayed for Abimelech. Christ prayed for me. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which you've given me. For they are thine. Abraham prayed for Abimelech. The Lord Jesus Christ prayed for me. And you know what? God answered Abim uh, Abraham's prayer. Abimelech's family was healed. And the children were born again. The wombs, life was opened. Christ prays and life comes. He never prays in vain. He's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Life comes as a result of his prayers, and this did not take place into the problem was taken care of. Sarah had to be restored. And the reason I'm saved is the problem's been taken care of. My sin's been put away. I've been restored. He wouldn't do it. Unless the problem was taken care of. And the problem was taken care of on Calvary's tree. And Sarah was restored. Sin put away. And the wombs were opened for the sake of Abraham's prayers. And life is given as a result of Christ dying on the cross. And taking care of the problem. And praying to the Father in behalf of his people. Aren't scriptures amazing? I love the Word of God. The Scriptures are so amazing. And this is a beautiful example of the amazingness of the Scriptures. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for your gospel, how we thank you for your Word, how we thank you for your grace. 
How we thank you for the revelation of your Son. How we thank you for the forgiveness of sins for Christ's sake. How we thank you that salvation is of thee, that is wholly your work. Lord, we confess we would not be saved if that were not the case. Lord, we see ourselves and Abraham so much. But Lord, we're also thankful that Abraham, by your grace, staggered not at your promise through unbelief. His old man didn't believe, but the new man you gave him did. Oh, Lord, may we walk by faith, looking to your Son, relying completely on who you are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.